So uh, some nuances for the surgery, and I know this is kind of ahead of you guys because you're not quite uh, in the neurosurgery programs yet, but you will be. And then you can look ahead to doing some Chiari malformation uh, cases in your residency. It's quite a common operation in all hospitals um, that do neurosurgery. You need uh, decent uh, bony decompression. So the occipital bone's been removed, the dura has been opened. You can see the uh, cerebral hemispheres and the tonsils. You need to open up into the uh, area of the fourth ventricle, which is by going in the midline between the cerebellar tonsils to make sure the obex is exposed. And at the end, you do this uh, duraplasty. So you put a patch here and you sew it in place and uh, you make sure there's enough ample um, decompression that's been performed uh, to do this operation. So this is the tried and true method. It's a standard method. We'll talk about other ways of dealing with this um, subsequently. Uh, after surgery, um, headache can occur. That's complication, sometimes usually from just the alteration in the CSF dynamics. If you get a CSF leak happening, uh, that's a problem because that can set up the stage for meningitis. Uh, you can also get hydrocephalus if you're unlucky, uh, if patient's unlucky, and get uh, a need for some kind of CSF diversion, whether it's a shunting or a, a endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, persistent syrinx or recurrence of syrinx, as I showed you in some of my cases, uh, something called cerebellar slump. If you take too much bone away, there's no support to hold the cerebellum up, and so it can drop down into the uh, uh, decompression site, and that's not a good thing to have. Pa patients can become uh, quite symptomatic from that. So um, there are some articles, and I'm showing uh, this one here. This is uh, published in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, and it's on the use of this uh, duroplasty, which I showed you a picture of, and obex exploration compared to bone-only decompression. So just taking away the bone, but not doing a duroplasty. And the conclusions from this paper was that um, patients presenting with a syrinx who underwent expansile duroplasty and obex had a greater chance of syrinx and symptom resolution without increased risk of CSF related complications compared to those who underwent bone only decompression. So if you have a syrinx, then it's probably best to open up and uh, let things um, kind of uh, settle down. On the other hand, uh, if there's no syrinx, but there is like bony um, uh, compression, sometimes bone only decompression is sufficient and you haven't opened the dura and you haven't subjected the patient to the risk of CSF leak and meningitis and so on. And that by itself might be uh, sufficient for some of these cases. And here's the example of the OBEX exploration in this article. I'm just taking uh, pictures, uh, lysis of adhesions, and um, showing the OBEX that's been opened up here and uh, after lysis of adhesions. So yeah, you've got to, uh, you have to be good at microneural surgery to do a good carry decompression. It's a nice operation. It's a great operation. I would say it's an operation that uh, junior to mid-range uh, level residents should be able to do. Uh, as I said, it's a common operation at many, many hospitals. It occurs both in uh, children and in adults. Okay, another one is outcomes. As our, another article in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, outcomes in children undergoing posterior fossa decompression and duroplasty with and without tonsillar uh, reduction for Chiari-1 and Sringham, a, a pilot uh, prospective study. And essentially what this is showing you is a difference between the duroplasty and the duroplasty with um, uh, tonsillar uh, reduction. And, and so my um, demonstration to you of doing that tonsillar pexy was what I called it, is a demonstration of that. And you can see what happened in this uh, patient population and not a lot of p-value alterations that were different between the two groups which was uh, interesting uh, when you consider these things so headache valsalva these these types of things um, so it doesn't look like uh, tonsillar reduction has uh, much to do with the end result um, so it's kind of up to you to decide whether or not uh, you want to do it i i do it typically because I really like what I see on the post-operative MRI uh, images. And when I haven't done it, I've had uh, one or two cases that have had to go back to surgery because there was still significant blockage at the foramen magnum. Okay, 
Another paper recently is 2021, uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics again, dural augmentation approaches in complication rates after posterior fossa decompression for Chiari 1 and syringomyelia. The bottom line is that the compl rate, complication rates of dural autograft and non-autologous graft, so something off the shelf you're using to patch as opposed to the person's own um, material, uh, fascia to, to, to graft, uh, results in about the same outcomes. But that said, pseudomeningocele rates were a little bit higher in the non-autologous um, group and slightly higher meningitis rates. But um, the uh, equivalency in terms of reduction in serine size was the same, headache and so on. All those things were equal. Uh, I just think it makes sense to use somebody's own tissue if you can. So I, I typically harvest the uh, pericranium from the occipital and parietal area. I get a nice uh, piece of that to use as my patch as opposed to something off the shelf. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.